Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Thomas. Welcome to last Wednesday lunch. I serve as the education and outreach coordinator at the Zuckerman Museum of Art and I'm really happy today that we have Jeff Campana with us to talk to you on our program. Let me tell you a little bit about Jeff. He is a nationally exhibiting ceramic artist working primarily in functional pottery and sculptural vessel form. Prior to his appointment at KSU in 2013, he was a long-term artist in resident and Wingate Fellow at the Archie Bray Foundation for Ceramic Art in Helena, Montana. He has taught at the University of Louisville, Indiana University Southeast, and Bennington College in Vermont. As an active exhibitor, Jeff Campana has had work in more than 100 exhibitions of national and regional scope and has been featured in numerous magazines and books on the topic of ceramic art. In the summer of 2016, he returned to Helena, Montana as a resident artist of Studio 740, where he completely reinvented his studio practice. The new work, a product of a deconstructed mold system, debuted in the fall of 2017 in the international exhibition Breaking the Mold at Eutectic Gallery in Portland, Oregon. A master of wheel throwing and mold making, Jeff Campana's major research interests are now based in computer-aided design and the transformation of digital file to ceramic production via a variety of additive and subtractive tools. It is so great to have you here today, Jeff. Thank you for giving us your time. Welcome. All right. Um, thank you all for coming. And I guess I sort of view this as something to be filed into the internet as a YouTube video as well, where I'm sure I will direct a lot of people who couldn't make it today. Um, and so I thought this is a really great opportunity to really just collect my thoughts about where we've been, where we're going, what all of the new technologies that um, I've been part of bringing in to the School of Art and Design. Um, and it's kind of like a snapshot in time. I actually, I'm no documentarian, so I really, um, had to just kind of like scrape a lot of old photographs to find some of this stuff. Um, and I'm glad that I collected it all. So I see this as an asset moving forward. Um, so first of all, I want to say if any of you have questions as we go, um, this is not what I would call like a rehearsed written presentation. So at any point you could ask a question and that's totally fine with me. Um, so I'll begin by just talking about, this is sort of a chronological story of the initiative to bring makerspace technologies into the School of Art and Design. Um, I am, I would say, the one spearheading most of that right now, but I'm not the one who began it, and I'm not the only one who's part of it. So um, I just want to make that clear. Um, where I began is actually, we got back in 2014, we got our first MakerBot, which was, that was very new technology. Uh, MakerBot Replicator 2 was probably the first really like mass audience 3D printer for consumers. So prior to that, if you wanted a 3D printer, um, that's gonna cost you $50,000 probably. Um, it was a technology that was very much reserved for industry. So, um, you know, it marks the beginning of like the widespread use of 3D printing. So we were right there at the beginning. We got a MakerBot right when they came out. Um, Christine Huang Kim is the one who got it. And she presented a faculty workshop where anybody who wanted to could come and learn this technology. And this was like, maybe I saw a YouTube video about it one time, but I, it was very much not in the public mentality of, you know, things that you can do. So it was very transformative. In that workshop, we just made a simple, tiny, I want to say it was like a two, two centimeter cube and put a hole in it. But we, what's important is we did that. We designed it and then went through the entire process of printing it. There's a lot of steps to that. 
that most people don't know about. Unless you've done it, you probably have no way of knowing about it. Um, but you have to convert the file to instructions for the printer, which is called slicing. Um, you have to make sure you line up the model correctly so that it will print properly. There's a lot of hidden steps. Um, anyways, so this little cube, um, as a maker of many things throughout my entire life, this cube is objectively not very impressive. However, it I was spellbound by it. Having it, something, there was some kind of magic that I didn't expect where when you take something that exists fully as bits and you turn them into atoms, it's like sorcery. And that really stuck with me. Um, I was obsessed from that moment on with 3D printing. And I'll say this, with all the students that I've taught and other professors at this point, people are either spellbound immediately by it or fairly indifferent to it. Um, and you'll know kind of immediately uh, who is who. Um, what we see in the School of Art and Design as important is at least we expose everybody to it at this point um, so that the ones who really are drawn to it have that experience as early in their education as possible. Um, so anyways, I was obsessed with it and um, thought about it nonstop after that. However, it took years and years to actually build the skill set needed. Um, so this type of printing that the MakerBot does is called FDM. It's fused deposition modeling. Uh, essentially, it's like a hot glue gun on a robot arm is the easiest way to describe it. It just deposits layer by layer of plastic on top of you and in progressive layers. Um, the You can definitely see the evidence that it was 3D printed on FDM prints, even in the really finest settings. Um, but so we had the MakerBot and I dabbled with it for a couple of years. Um, didn't really get very far because the first time I tried to make a mold of a FDM printed thing, the plaster stuck to it really bad. And I never really, it took me a while to figure out uh, the workaround. Um, and I'll get back to that. So two years later, um, in our year end budget request, um, I asked for a Formlabs uh, 3D printer, which is a different technology. This uses resin and UV sensitive, uh, it's UV sensitive resin and it uses UV lasers to set progressive layers of the um, form. And it builds forms, it still stacks a form layer by layer, but what's important to note is the material is of a far higher quality and also the layers are far smaller. So the layers on these are 50 microns. It can even go finer than that, but that means 20 layers per millimeter, which you cannot feel that when you scrape your fingernail across it. You cannot see it without a magnifying glass. It's very, very fine. Um, so this was, the reason that we moved to this was that FDM printers, and we learned this from the MakerBot, and we also consulted with Randy Emmert in engineering. There's almost no uh, reliability at that point. Um, basically you'd print a thing and then the printer would break, then you'd have to order parts and try to fix the thing. And then you'd print another thing and the printer would break again. So that was kind of the workflow. And what we learned is that the Form Labs was the first consumer grade printer that you could afford. It's more expensive. It's about $3,500, but um, it's far more reliable. Um, in fact, the one that I ordered back in 2016 still works perfectly fine, and it has not really needed any repairs. So um, it was, you know, a very good purchase for sure. And it's through this that I really engaged a lot. This lived in my office for a while. Um, and so I learned it in order to maybe someday teach it. Um, a couple years later, we got a few more of them. And let's see if I can get this to play. Um, this is what it looks like. So there's a laser that whips around. That's actually clear resin. So it's a crystal clear thing that I'm printing. It looks just like glass. 
and it drops just 20 microns higher or 50 microns higher and does that same process. So, you know, an object that is six inches tall, maybe that takes like two days to print where it never turns off, never stops doing this um, layer by layer, it just builds it up. Um, this is where we really tried to get a lab and I started teaching it in my slip casting and mold making class. Uh, we had three of them. So, you know, a relatively small class of six students, I could reasonably get everything printed within a week as long as everything worked out well. This basically was the first time that we could print in a class because we now had enough of them to do it. Um, it's one of the biggest problems in schools when you try to teach this. If you only have a couple printers and you have 20 students and each of their prints takes three days to complete, then you do not have enough time in the semester or by the time they get their print back, they're completely over that whole design experience. So, you know, it was a, an awakening to needing more of these printers. The first lab was actually in uh, 208, which is our conference room. And back then we still had meetings in person primarily. Um, and so these things were just going off during meetings constantly, which helped me, they make a little bit of sound. So that helped me actually begin to move into another room. So this is space grabbing 101 um, on universities. Uh, everybody is scrapping for space. One of the things I learned, and maybe this window is in the way, um, uh, one of the things I learned is that if you own a vinyl cutter, then you have a much better chance of keeping space that you try to steal. So uh, this was uh, basically a disused room, in my opinion. It just had a bunch of stuff that we were storing in it, but it didn't have classes or any purpose. And I asked you if I could move the printers in there to get them out of the conference room. He said yes. And then I went ahead and just made it look like it had always been a 3D tech lab. Um, so that's how I got that first space. Oops. Um, so uh, yeah, we had a space and we were provided with a student assistant, Hanson Bassey is his name. And we had in there uh, the, the TAS, a new TAS printer, which is the FDM printer an Oculus Rift headset, a high powered computer that could handle that kind of stuff and a 3D scanner as well as the form labs. So we moved all that stuff in there um, amidst a bunch of other stuff. So we were kind of just on top of a layer of uh, kind of abandoned books and other th things like that. Um, here's the TAS 6 and this is an FDM printer. This is what it looks like when it runs. Um, so it's like upside down compared to the form labs and it just starts at the bottom and stacks these layers and kind of draws them layer by layer. What we like about FDM is that it's far cheaper. It's about a tenth of the price for the material and it also prints mostly air. So you can just get a lot more work for a lot less money. Um, to put that in perspective, the form labs is $150 per liter. So you have to really like that design to want to use that kind of material where we can take bigger risks with the FDM. I thought these were good enough at this point, but they really weren't. So um, that one we didn't use very long before we moved on to something else. Um, so now I'll just talk about some of this other equipment. So it's not just about 3D printing, it's about how do you make the files. and the Oculus Rift is a VR headset, um, which are pretty popular now. At the time, they were pretty rare, and they only plugged into high power computers. So that was why they were rare. Um, what it allowed for us to do is there's a lot of learning curve, really steep learning curve for learning how to CAD model. It's very, very difficult at first to even get used to a three dimensional space represented by a two dimensional plane, which is your computer screen. And this thing is supposed to exist in that space. That abstraction makes it very hard to learn. Um, the Oculus Rift, you are in a 3D space. So your 3D file is represented in three dimensions, which makes it far better um, and far more intuitive. 
So the only problem with this is we just have, it's one person at a time. So um, this for years, this thing was constantly occupied uh, by students who were working on projects. This is a video of Wes Sanders, who was the first one who got really good at it. Um, and that's him interacting with the space. So he sees a reality we don't see. I would say that this feels like stepping into a dream where you're able to create whatever you want. And then miraculously, you can print that thing when you're done. Um, it is just a completely spellbinding experience. Um, so anyways, Wes would be the, in there constantly for several years, just working on things. He's totally self-trained. He's a painter actually, and created this remarkable chess set that's based on the movie Metropolis, the, the old silent film. Um, and it was totally self, uh, self assigned and fully extracurricular. Um, but I feel like it's some of the best work, student work that I've seen. Um, the level of detail is amazing. He got the help of Hansen to, they basically called it a collaboration because Hansen knew how to render things um, and that to have a file that looks good digitally. So uh, they worked together on that. But it was sculpted in VR using Adobe Medium. It was rendered in 3D Studio Max to get the really sharp image on the right. And then it was printed on the Formlabs printer and you know it still exists in the lab as an artifact of the time. Um, the other cool technology that we entered when once we got a space was 3D scanning, which allows us to document things fully in 3D um, existing objects. Um, it's perfect in scale for the most part. So um, archaeologists will use it to measure. So you could scan something and then you can measure it, and it's far more accurate than what you can do with say a digital caliper or by hand and by eye. So um, anyways, that's one of the uses for it. The other thing is it can capture color. So if you're making a digital file with that scan, um, you can have it look pretty realistic. And then you can of course take these and alter them however you want. So this is what it looks like. It looks like the future for sure. Um, it plays a video of uh, lines moving from one side to the other and from the top to the bottom, it's a sequence. And that is able to capture with a video camera and piece together the information to make a model. So this is one of the first tests that we did where it was uh, just a, like a artifact that one of the, that Phil Kiernan had in his office and we tried to scan it. And we were on the right, you can see we were able to replicate that thing one for one, pretty much with very little loss of detail. It did all the undercuts, uh, pretty amazing. So those were the new technologies and oops, uh, we ended up doing a lot of this free form, just, you know, it's not part of classes yet. It's just a laboratory where people explore. It was a really pretty wonderful time. Um, I would say now it's more, it serves classes, so it feels different. Um, this is the step to where we were able to serve classes instead of just individuals who are interested in research that was self-directed. Um, the print farm, this is the idea of having multiple printers that can then accommodate a large class size. So the first print farm was when the drawing, painting, and printmaking moved over to Chastain Point. This room was made available and uh, using my trusty vinyl cutter, I made it into the Department of Engineering Technology and School of Art and Design 3D Print Farm. Um, this is the first interdisciplinary collaboration with 3D printing on this campus. It has started a much larger initiative uh, in the years to come. However, what's worth noting here is that the now that we have 10 printers, these were supplied by engineering technology department. They had a lab with about double this many printers at the time, and they were serving all sorts of different students and the public with 3D printing projects. And it was already a little bit more integrated into their curriculum. And so Randy Emmer, at, he gave us these printers and then 
more importantly, helped us teach us how to use them and maintain them. And that created the first, so he had a lab that he was sort of overseeing in our building, as well as on the other campus. So um, this one lasted about a year before that space then was utilized for something else. And we were able to clear out all the extra stuff that wasn't relevant and move that all out of here. Um, okay, so the kind of printers we have are Creality CR20s. They're small-ish printers. What's important to note is that, you know, from 2014, when maybe a MakerBot was several thousand dollars, now in 2020, a Creality printer made in China is maybe $400, and that's a pretty nice one. Um, so the prices come way down. So for the price of one iMac, we could get 10 printers in the lab and allow for a totally transformative um, process. They're much more reliable at this point than they used to be. They're still, they require a fair amount of maintenance. So we have a team that handles that now of student assistants. Um, but we built this lab to study the various, the different ways that various disciplines engage with the technology. And the large number of printers allowed us to even start thinking about just having full classes where they have a project that they have to 3D print. Um, it moved pretty quickly in the next year when we got booted, we cleared out another space. This is the original 3D tech lab without anything unrelated to 3D printing in it. And it housed now, uh, we got some money from the student technology fee um, on campus. We got $100,000 to outfit this lab and multiple others accordingly. So now we have 30 printers and they are going pretty much nonstop. So um, we have a variety of scales. You can see on the bottom, I don't know if it's apparent in this image, but we have bigger ones on the bottom and smaller ones. And that allows for different size print jobs while also being able to cram as many printers in as possible. Um, so yeah, we have a fair amount of things. We also added an, a second Oculus and an EinScan which is a much more advanced 3D scanner. So that's how the lab exists now. That's what it looks like. We painted the walls white and we got the whole room sort of reorganized and went vertical with these. Um, they're also networked together so that students can monitor their own prints in the class. So they never, they don't have to communicate too much. They can just see the process unfold of the, printing their file. Um, at the moment, this is where the curriculum is, is we have integrated this um, into 3D design officially. So starting next year, every single 3D design class, which every single art student takes, will go through a training process and use these 3D printers for that class. Um, from there, they can use it or not use it in other classes. Um, sculpture has really embraced this, which is kind of a glove fit because they are involved in making 3D objects. So of course, 3D printing is a great tool to add right along with the table saw and the welders, you know. Um, then in ceramics, I use it in mold making and slip casting and some students move on in advanced ceramics and use it more. The, We've also integrated this in directly and curricularly into the MA in Museum Studies and the MA in Art Education. And that will be happening, uh, the Art Education one will be happening this summer. Um, it's a class dedicated to makerspace technologies. Um, and then digital animation has begun. They took a hiatus and they'll be back. But um, now that Paul Orlando is hired on a permanent basis, he will probably pour more of his attention into the lab, but he was the earlier explorer from animation. Um, to me, that's a glove fit as well because they're already designing objects in 3D using Maya and in order to animate them, but you know, we can just print action figures or you know, artifacts that they're creating in those classes. And then it kind of changes what's possible with those skill sets. Um, I'll take a minute to acknowledge that this 
at this point, the lab is not really just mine. Um, it's part of a bigger team. So we last summer got together and called it, put a name to it. It's the 3D printing ecosystem. This graph was part of a grant application for an NSF IUS grant. And this was made by Dominic Thomas in business. Um, this is how we see this whole thing working. So it's not just a lab, it's actually a combination of people, software and hardware that work together to allow really incredible things to happen. Um, so the students who maintain the equipment and who run prints for the, you know, the enrolled students in classes, they are creating, um, those students all work together as a team. And um, so we have business students working in the art lab. We have engineer, teams of engineering students who go around and maintain the equipment because that's part of their discipline. We have the information systems under Dominic are doing, working on rewriting uh, like a software that we can use possibly moving forward. Um, in order to network everything. Currently, everything is networked. So for instance, from my home computer here, I can print a file in engineering, in architecture, in business, in art, if I so choose. Um, and that's, I have admin privileges, but it's worth noting that, you know, if one lab goes down or gets overwhelmed by the amount of prints that need to happen, we can offload that very easily to other labs. So this is a much bigger initiative. It touches five colleges currently, and we expect seven by next year, which would be more than half of the entire university. Um, and this is, we recently won an award for innovation. This is not something that other campuses have at this scale. This is, we are on the cutting edge with really bringing this to the masses. Um, but in engineering technology, Randy Emmert is kind of the head who has built this thing, had the vision for it. Um, I was lab number two. Business was lab number three to come online. Architecture was no stranger to 3D printing, but now they're networked into our lab as well. Um, and then the newest lab is, and smallest lab so far is in humanities. And that is uh, primarily utilized by geographical information systems and they print three-dimensional maps and things of that sort. So this is a, an initiative that grew from, you know, within just a year, actually, it has grown um, by leaps and bounds, exponential rate. There's thousands and thousands of prints getting done on campus, on both campuses every semester. Um, and now I'll just talk, so that's basically the history of the lab. Now I'll talk a little bit about the noteworthy uh, projects. And this is not all of the projects, I just whittled it down to some of the ones that I thought would be the most intriguing. Um, one of the early adopters was Dr. Phil Kiernan, and he is an archeologist and he digs things out of the earth in Germany that are Roman artifacts is his specialty. Um, so here's a cup that was unearthed that is shards, it's missing pieces. And this is some exploration he's doing with Paul Orlando in animation, who has the skills in Maya to re, you know build form um, very effectively and then skin that form. So this picture here on the bottom left appears that that is a terracotta pot. Um, th this is the backside of it. And then here's a, uh, it's not a scan, it's called photogrammetry, which is um, in the field, you can't really have a 3D scanner. It wouldn't hold up to the elements very well. Um, so Phil takes pictures with a camera and stitches those together to create something akin to a 3D scan. And then that file was taken and parts of it were reconstructed using some of the more basic tool set um, in CAD modeling of just revolving a profile around a central axis and it could fill in the blanks. And then um, this is an expertise I do not have, but Paul does. Uh, he was able to render it to look like clay. Um, this, so it's, uh, it's kind of a new idea in archeology. span They do a lot of this um, through drawings and imagination, but now 
you have these computer tools available. Um, the Fortuna statue, this was actually unearthed during the pandemic in Germany by Phil at his dig site. And he took pictures of it and stitched them together, emailed it to me over here um, when you couldn't even fly across between countries. And I was able to 3D print a model of it um, over here, which is pretty incredible. So that's the one on the right here um, was the one I 3D printed remotely across the ocean. Um, since then, we've, ply, we've printed a few others in different materials and scales. Um, it's worth noting that uh, we only just now have a printer that we can print the full scale statue. So a lot of this is scaled down. Um, on the left is Wes Sanders, that student who is um, learning in VR that I showed earlier. He sculpted the missing head of the Fortuna based on information from Phil. It's part of a project where he wants different artists to reconstruct and um, you know, have maybe interchangeable heads on these statues. Um, here's a 3D print of that pop. So these are art historical, archeological applications. This is perhaps in my mind, the biggest project that has happened. The Root House public artwork. Um, this is Paige Birch his student Emmy Keenan and the Master Craftsman class. So we have this class that Paige leads that they get commissions for artwork and then uh, the students present ideas, the client takes their favorite idea and then the class builds that project. Um, so they get this experience and they have public art out in the world. Um, for the Root House, it's a museum on Marietta Square. Um, they made a project talking about the history and the unrecorded history of the um, sort of the past. So uh, I'll show a picture of it in situ, but this is the technological part. Um, we had students use the big scanner called the EinScan, which can scan entire people. And we scanned a model in dressed in like period where and then that thing got broken into planes using the um, Fusion 360 program. And then here's a print of that. So we're able to take this file and it's pretty remarkable. It looks just like fabric. Um, and then this is really the, the middle one is what was the, became this object. So what we have is it's talking about the history of enslaved people. It has this, it's addressing the idea, here we are at a, a museum of a family's history in Marietta, and we have all kinds of records about all of the like white people who live there, but the enslaved people, we have no history. So it engages with this idea that there's no history recorded. And so this piece looks solid from a three quarter of the side. This image on the right is actually an image of the same piece, but you just can't see it when you are head on because it's made from very thin pieces of Corten steel. Um, so it, it, you actually, as you walk past it, it disappears. Um, so that was designed by a student, commissioned and paid for by the Root House Museum. And now it's a permanent work of art as part of that museum. Um, Another thing that we've been working on for a while now, um, we scanned some pieces for the museum of Ruth Zuckerman's uh, artwork. And with the idea, this was led by Elizabeth Thomas and helped by Randy Emmert. And uh, we have a couple of student assistants who came over and scanned. Um, and then we have also incorporated it into a museum studies class. It's been thwarted several times. So the first time uh, we tried to do this, the we need a laser cutter. Um, the first time it was the pandemic, shut it down. And then the second time we revamped it and we had the MA class build different types of puzzles that are interactive, made from pieces from the Ruth Zuckerman's, uh, you know, her artwork. So, um, we got as far as a handful of designs and then we lost access to the laser cutters in architecture. 
because they are growing just like we are and they do they have to conserve the resources for themselves. So anyways, we'll resume it again, but it's been a really long, I think it's probably been four years at this point that we've been trying to do it, um, but we'll get there and it will be awesome. But we envision making this out of the scraps from of plexiglass from building vitrines and other things and framing in the museum. So that's a, another project. I wanna showcase here for a moment, my student, Ali Benoit, she is the one who runs the lab. So thankfully I'm not running the day to day. I have a student assistant and she runs it. She's doing a great job. I don't know how I'll replace her when she graduates, um, but this is her work. So she works in ceramics and she is taking, she's really learned a lot about CAD modeling and she's taking that much like I do. Um, she's making 3D prints to then make molds, which you pour slip into to create ceramic objects. So it's a similar workflow, um, but she has designed all these aspects. Um, when you make a mold, there's a lot of handwork and it's not very pleasant to make everything fit together properly. And a lot of this has been outsourced and designed in the digital environment, which allows for, um, you know, just a lot more streamlined and far better quality output than you otherwise would. What we're essentially doing now is taking things that were reserved for a big industry where maybe you're making 100,000 plus pieces and we are bringing that down to the small scale studio and we can make very, you know, small runs, like maybe a hundred things and it's worth it. So uh, similar workflow, this is my work currently and I'm utilizing uh, animation software called Blender, which allows for me to break things into little cubes and then I make molds of those. Um, and it creates this really remarkable texture that at once feels, I think, like textiles. Um, it feels very much digital. It does not look like a pot you've seen before. Um, and there's just, I don't know, there's a lot to explore with this. So there's a number of ceramic artists exploring these technologies, but, um, and I'm one, I'm just one of them, but this is the work that I'm doing currently. The Makerspace Collective is a student org that you exist to utilize these technologies that are available to the students on extracurricular projects. So we formalized what we used to do in the lab before it became more serving classes. And we've turned that into a club. They, and I let the club do whatever they're interested in. And it turns out they're very interested in cosplay. And so a lot of them are like printing their own like suits of armor or whatnot to wear to Dragon Con and things of that nature. But there's a really famous person in that field that they've brought in two years in a row as a guest speaker uh, remotely. And it's been really wonderful both times. And his name is Frankly Built. He has like a half a million followers on YouTube and is kind of like celebrity status in the cosplay work. So that's what we've been doing. And now we're sort of getting to wrapping it up. I would just want to talk about the future, what I see as the future. Some of that is already set, a set path, and some of it is yet to be uh, realized, but I sort of envision that happening as the technology advances. Um, this last semester, I was able to get a $100,000 equipment acquisition through the student technology fees um, on campus. And what that afforded us is five laser cutters. Um, so this is not 3D printing. Um, we're primarily gonna use these for paper and cardboard products um, that you can then cut with remarkable precision. And that involves using two-dimensional files that once you cut it out of a material, then it becomes a three-dimensional building block. Um, so much like those puzzles that we I was talking about with the museum, these are things that we're trying to get um, you know, into the workflow as early as possible in 3D design. Three of them are going right in the 3D design classroom and they'll just be available during class for students to use to cut things. That class, we tend to make projects out of uh, cardboard and paper 
a lot because it's really cheap and we can teach, we do not need expensive materials to teach the concepts. Um, you'll see this in the architecture building too, just tons of projects that are made out of like, you know, found cardboard and they're incredible. So we're gonna bring the computers into that aspect pretty soon. And then in uh, one of those will go in the new photo and graphics tech lab that they're building in 208. And then another one will be a big one that can cut metal and, all, and wood and all sorts of things will be hosted temporarily in the theater scenery shop until we can build out a space in Chastain Point in the future. Um, additionally, I got a four by eight foot CNC router, which allows us to put whole sheets of plywood or um, what's called polyurethane foam. Um, and we can mill that. This is something that we've been doing for quite a while, utilizing um, architecture's wood shop. Um, however, like I was saying before, we're sort of cut off from that. So we needed to start thinking about um, equipping ourselves with the things that we need. Um, this will also live temporarily in the theater scenery shop. They already have a CNC router and know the technology. Um, and they're happy to have a bigger one until we need it back. And we can use it as we please. Um, this is going to really enable giant projects from real materials. So um, one of the drawbacks, I guess, with 3D printing is that it's always this kind of like cheap plastic knickknack sort of feel. Um, but these technologies are allowing us, maybe we can prototype in 3D printing and then make real things. We could carve something out of a solid block of mahogany or something like that if we wanted. And, or, you know, if we can carve it out of foam, then we can pour it out of bronze. So this is really the doorway into using the technology to design things in uh, like a lot more, what I would call real materials. Um, and finally, um, this is just a glimpse of the future that I saw. Um, Stratasys, which is the big industrial 3D printing company, brought this project, this bus, to the other campus. Um, and they showed something called polyjet printing, which custom mixes little voxels or uh, three-dimensional pixels of different they can mix any color, CMYK, they can do that opaque, they can do that clear, they can also mix rubbers of different shore hardnesses in the same print. Um, they can do all kinds of things with the same machine and it requires absolutely no cleanup or anything afterwards. Some things you need support material and if you need that, it actually prints a, a support material that you just run it under a faucet and it disappears. So there's like not very much handwork in this, but these are some of the objects they printed with that. Um, I'm looking at the left here of that wine bottle and all that package design. And I, I see how that could be very relevant to our graphics majors. Um, this figure, this bust in the middle is made from a CT scan. And it, it's like a diagram of a real person and like a cutaway view of the different veins, vessels, nervous system. Um, it was, and it was full scale. It was remarkable to see. Um, and then this one, I actually have a video. This slice of pizza was uh, a regular slice of pizza, uh, 3D scanned all the way around and then just printed in this printer that can print, it can build pixel by pixel in real color. Um, and it's remarkable. So this is what it looked like. Um, even holding it, I couldn't believe it that that wasn't cheese and that that wasn't pepperoni. It was really pretty crazy. They also had a peach that was fuzzy. Um, these printers right now are $100,000 for the printer and probably a hefty sum. The salesman wouldn't even tell me how much the material cost is. So that's not good. However, as we've seen, these technologies are getting cheaper all the time. So, you know, I could very easily see a future where all of our students know how to use the basic tools. And then maybe we have something like this that can really make some top notch things. It's also worth noting most design houses for industrial design 
already used these because um, you get a real object and not just like some drawings to bring to a client. So um, that's the future that I was given a glimpse of just recently. Um, so I guess that's it. Um, I guess if we have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I want to thank you for uh, sharing this history of where things have been and how they got to where they are and where things might go. Uh, a theme you've hinted at a few times, I just thought uh, to ask your thought about e-waste with the nature of these printing technologies. Yeah, so there's different kinds of waste. Um, so there's definitely the e-waste of these printers not being utilized and then we have to get rid of them. Yeah. Um, currently they are just, as they as we retire them, they're just sitting around. Um, we've been much more uh, cognizant of, you know, all the labs using the same printers so we can, okay. as printers sort of reach their end of life, at least we can cannibalize them a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but it is a problem. Um, but this is like a problem that just happens and is sort of unavoidable when you're an early adopter to yeah. things. Um, you know, there are definitely, there's printing, there's filament companies that are trying to create uh, the workflow for how to recycle this. We're actually working, so, you know, it's a lot of plastic that we're printing out of. Um, the PLA that we use is not from petroleum. Doesn't mean it's not at least a little bit evil but um, it's made from corn and sugar cane. Okay. And it smells like that, actually. The reason we use it is it's easy to print with, and it's also non-toxic to people in the space. So uh, we've had EHS come in and monitor uh, for VOCs, um, and they, are, they were shocked how little of a problem that is in those labs. So that it's really safe to work around. However, it's still plastic. It is biodegradable, but not if you just throw it in the garbage. Okay. Um, so we are, you know, there's a little bit of waste that's happening currently. We've looked into um, getting a melter um, to melt our own filament and possibly then we can collect, especially if we are all on the same page about the same color, we can collect that and then mill it down and then turn it back into filament. So I think that thing got ordered and then it got like postponed. I'm not really sure where that's at, but now that we have hundreds of printers across five colleges, it really makes sense to start building the ecosystem about how to handle the waste. Okay. Um, but we're not there yet. So honestly, a lot of things get printed that are then plastic in the world. Um, and, you know, we actually, it's imperative to what we're trying to teach that you do make mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, right now, hopefully people, I think most students really cherish the things they made, even, even if they don't turn out. So we don't throw them away. And, you know, pretty much 100% of the students will take the failed prints as well as the finished successful okay. ones. Um, I don't know what they're doing with it after that, but, um, you know, this is part of it. The whole 3D printing world realizes this and there's a lot of people working on solutions. Um, we were thinking we haven't, the problem is uh, a lot of the right now where the tech is, it's DIY to make a lot of the equipment that you would use to process it. And the EHS is not okay with us making our own filament grinder, right? Um, or they're not really fine with us making, they want things that are like UL certified and all that. So if we, one good thought one of the students had was we can melt down the plastic into blocks that they can then use as a closed loop to learn CNC milling because mm -hmm. plastic is dream to mill. So if we just, you know, made, melted down the plastic into blocks, then we could use that. Right now they're using solid blocks of aluminum over in, uh, okay. you know, over in engineering where they teach that. Thank you. Do you have a way to safely melt the plastic into cubes? Um, that's where we don't have that because you need, the first step is to grind it into little chips. Oh. And, you know, you can buy industrial grinders, but they're 
crazy expensive and way overbuilt for what we would need. And then I've seen DIY models that, although I would use it myself, the, you know, there's no way the university would allow for that kind of stuff. If we just made a, a dangerous piece of uh, equipment that we want to use. Yeah. But only yeah. so much danger we can accommodate, right? <laughs> right. Again. So th there's, I would call it a necessary evil at this point, but, um, you know, I guess it's something that we think about and are working on. Uh, any other questions? Well, I would be curious if you had an estimate on the number of students that have the reaction of being super jazzed about 3D technology versus indifference? Um, it's higher than ceramics, I'll say. So um, it's probably, it seems to be about like maybe 40% of them are immediately a little bit obsessed with it. Um, and then there's, you know, yeah. So I would say, yeah, like 40% is a high number, I would think, um, but it's, a lot more difficult than it seems. And so we try to present it in little bits and I'm working, we're trying to get it simpler is better. So we're trying to get it sim as simple as we can to start. So that's not frustrating right away. Yeah, lots of scaffolding is what I would need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it was perfect that I started with a cube with a hole in it, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm returning to that idea for how we write, we're spending the summer rewriting the curriculum in order to uh, best serve those 3D design students. And, and I, I'm thinking about that cube with a hole in it a lot. You know, this isn't um, a question that's directly related to your talk, but it is in the sense that that makerspace collective group sounds really exciting. And if they're interested in coming to the welcome party for the new um, so add students in the fall, they could um, maybe gain some new members. They could come and show off a little bit of what they've created and entice new members. Yep, that's a great idea. They definitely, it's a small group and they wish they were bigger. Um, and they've been doing a fair amount of outreach, but I think it's just the time we're at where <laughs> the campus was totally shut down for a while. And mm -hmm. so we're kind of bit by bit rebuilding campus life again, but they're, you know, they have increased with their enrollment. It's really exciting. Um, but yeah, yeah, I would like to do that. I'll send you some information. Any other last questions? No? Well, thank you again, Jeff, for coming. This has been a fabulous talk. I learned a tremendous amount. Thank you all very much. We we'll look forward to seeing you next month when I'm going to be giving a talk about the public art on campus. Thank you. Okay. Thank Have you a great all. day. Okay. Yeah.